What up, YouTube? It is Andrew Esquivel here coming back at you with a little thing that doesn't really have much to do with my channel. So what I'm actually going to be doing is a little test here. Uh, what I'm going to be trying to attempt in the next few weeks is my gourmet style crayfish. Which uh, sounds a little strange because normally these little mud bugs here are, are uh, cooked up Cajun style outside in a big propane boiler with yeah, a lot of um, vegetables and potatoes and stuff like that. And that's what helps add flavor to these guys. But this little guy, actually this big er guy, uh, he is alive, obviously. Oh, no, you don't get to pinch me. Nice try. So, what makes these guys different is I have a holding tank, 30 gallons, and I have like 40, 50 of these guys. Now, the key is to not eat them straight out of the way because otherwise they taste like their environment, and that's no good for me. So, much like Kobe beef, uh, in the sense that you feed the cow certain foods to flavor up the meat, I feed these crayfish frozen sweet peas. And the sweet peas will flavor up their flesh so that when it comes time to eat them, they taste a lot better. So it takes time and what it will result in is a much better tasting crayfish because these aren't going to be boiled even though that pot is boiling for this guy right here. They're actually going to be steamed a lot like lobsters and as we know, lobsters are a much more premium meat. So in order to get that lobster kind of flavor out of these little mud bugs, we gotta take the bug out of the environment and take the environments out of the bug at the same time. So uh, he's just chilling right now inside the cup. Let him derp around as such. Now crayfish can survive out of water for a short time so long as their gills are wet. This guy is going to be dead in a few minutes anyway, and the reason I'm doing this is because I need a baseline. So in order to determine what a crayfish tastes like, more or less straight out of the wild, I need to boil them up and uh, get my baseline. That way when I do have my uh, gourmet crayfish, I'll call them, when they're prepared two or three weeks from now, after eating a bunch of sweet peas, I can get that good baseline going. So, uh, yeah, and as a chef, you know, I, I do a lot of cooking here at home because I'm nocturnal, which means there's not a lot of restaurants that are open when I'm awake, so I have to learn how to cook for myself. And I've learned to quick cook everything from Italian to Japanese and anything in between, but I've never really tackled uh, much southern food. Now, don't get me wrong, I've cooked up plenty of catfish and bass, and it's good when uh, you add the right flavorings, but especially with catfish being bottom feeders themselves, the flavor is really meh, not that great. So uh, what I'm doing here is getting these guys to taste good. And I've had crayfish before at restaurants, and they're pretty good, but I think I can do better. So I'm putting my chef skills to the test and what better ingredients I have than super fresh. So. This is about as fresh as it gets. I hand plucked these out of the river after over a course of a few days. And these, in case you're wondering, are rusty crayfish, extremely invasive. I, were, I uh, follow all the rules with the Department of Natural Resources with these guys. I've got permission to stock them so that I can consume them. Uh, obviously, you should never uh, you know, transfer these guys to another body of water because they can reproduce and then just totally destroy the ecosystem in that little area. So please be responsible with the species that you handle. In this case, like I said, rusty crayfish. Rusties are uh, very infamous for being uh, bullies to other native crayfish. And uh, believe it or not, I think we are at boiling capacity here. So. This little guy is not going to like it, but hey, this is life. So, if you're squeamish, if you don't like to see this sort of thing, turn off the video now. Do not go any further. This is how your lobster is cooked sometimes, or it might be steamed. So, get used to it. We're carnivores. Well, well technically humans are omnivores, just stating for the record. 
and this is how you cleanse them out. So, here we go. And, oh wow, take a look at that coloration. Isn't that beautiful? It turns a very vibrant red. Interesting. Now we set this on the timer for about five minutes. And that's going to kill the pathogens that may be inside this because, let's face it, it was from the wild. So we're not sure what exactly is inside the crayfish, but we are going to make sure this thing is fully safe to eat. Uh, the last thing I would ever want to do is have a crayfish fry and get someone sick. Uh, you know, that that's everyone's worst nightmare with coming with home with fresh food. You don't want to do anything that's going to get your guests or yourself ill. So always make sure to get a minimum temperature of around, I believe it's 145 for rare. Uh, hold on, I can actually check. Uh, yeah, about 145 for rare, but I like to get to 165 because at that temperature it kills just about every pathogen. So, uh, and I'm not going to make you guys uh, sit here and watch the whole thing. I'm just going to skip ahead to the next part. And we are just about ready with that five minute mark. What's very interesting is the crayfish has turned from that deep green to a very bright red. That's probably a result of something. Uh, I wish I knew what caused that, but it explains a lot in terms of whenever you gotta eat crayfish while they're red. So, it's been five minutes, so let's go ahead and shut it off. And it was in there since boiling, so it's been boiling the whole time. There's our rusty crayfish. Very dead and very red. Now let's see, this guy is hot, hot, hot. Yeah, I'm gonna say with my experience with food, and I've got a lot of experience cooking, that that is probably way over the uh, uh, 165 degree temperature. Now if you've never eaten a crayfish before, it's not that hard. You basically, uh, you grab hold let me focus the camera here. You grab hold on one side, and it's still really hot, jeez. Well, yeah, I mean, it's right out of the boiler here. But you grab one side here, and you pull the tail out, and the tail's full of that meat that you want. The claws here don't really contain much of any meat, which is really disappointing. On a, on a lobster, yeah, okay, they contain enough meat to try and want to go after it. But on a crayfish, all the good stuff is right down here in the tail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this cool down for a minute because uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to hold this without burning myself. So uh, I'll start the video back up when it's good and ready. Okay, so first off I want to address, yeah, I'm wearing a hat and it is backwards. So, so wear it forwards, you can't really see my face. And my hair, as you can see, is crazy. The weather outside was really hot, so it's all frizzy and whatnot, including my beard. Anywho, we got our rusty crayfish, which I, can't, I still can't believe how red it turned out. And it's still really, really hot, but uh, for everyone who's new to this, you just pull. And actually, ooh, this guy's full of meat here. Top shell came off pretty easily. Uh, the ones at the restaurants pull apart a little easier. This is all the meat uh, up front. And unfortunately, this is not the meat I'm after. It's this, which really isn't all that much. Now the hardest part is getting to that meat. Because I have to basically crack the shell and whatnot to get there. But in the interest, interest of being somewhat scientific, I want to see just how hot 
this meat got. And the thing is, it's, it's had some time to cool off. Definitely got past 110 degrees in this warm portion. So, I'm going to crack open the shell here, which, you know, there's probably a number of ways to go about it. I just kind of tear at it by hand. And it comes apart nicely. Actually, this is much nicer than at the restaurants. The restaurant ones have been sitting out in the heater for a really long time. And I've almost got all the meat. There we go, that finally slid out. And we got a little bit of green stuff here, and it probably has to do with the peas. But, believe it or not, one crayfish, this is all the meat you get. Which is why you gotta boil a lot of them. And, well, in this case, steam them. And... Actually, honestly, this meat's looking really good. I'm just kind of removing the green stuff because it's also near the area where they kind of poop. And I don't want no poop. Alright. So, uh, let me clean up my hands here because, yeah, it does get a little messy. Uh, but anyone who's eaten the lobster knows the same difficulties. Because they got that hard shell, they are a crustacean, yada yada. And these are actually going to be uh, kind of garnishing the plate. The main course is actually still going to be a southern-inspired uh, uh, type of food, which I'm hoping to uh, use bass or catfish. Preferably both, but maybe even some gar, because we have gar near where I fish. And these will be surrounding the plate with a fillet of gar, bass, or catfish. Uh, of course, caught in the wild. So, baseline test for a rusty crayfish. Let's give it a shot here. You know, all in all, that's actually pretty good. I think next time I'm going to cook it a little longer, just so it's warmer, stays warmer by the time I pull it out. It's a shame all this meat right here is kind of useless. But, I would have to say the baseline is pretty promising. Um, being in my tank, it's a fully cycled tank, and it's got aeration, and water flow, and filtration, etc. It's got plenty of sweet peas for the crayfish to eat. And this little guy's only been down there for, I don't know, two days, two, three days, probably. And already, I'd have to say the meat is pretty tasty. Now, for the sake of curiosity, I know you're looking at this big claw, and you're probably thinking, well, how much meat is in here? Well, since this little bastard can't pinch me anymore, and for the record, I have been pinched by a crayfish in the past, and it's really not all that bad. Now, a lobster, I'm sad, or I'm glad to say, never been pinched by a lobster. Can't imagine it'd be fun. Claw has this little bit of meat, but you know what? Still pretty good. So, alright. Probably wondering what's all left over. Well, that. This is the mess from a single crayfish, so you can imagine when I'm done doing like 40 or so, it's going to be a lot messier. But those are my plans for some home style, well, southern style, northern influenced, southern inspired, there we go, gourmet crayfish. 
That's a combination I don't think many people have ever had the pleasure of saying together. But uh, I do believe gourmet crayfish is completely possible. Um, it takes investment. It takes time. Just cycling a tank to hold these guys can take a month or two by itself without anything in it. And you cycle that with a fishless cycle. I use ammonium hydroxide to feed the bacteria that eats ammonia, ammonia, converts it to nitrites, and then converts it to nitrates. Do the water change about 20-30% once a week. And eventually you get a bacterial colony on your, in my case, ceramic media that uh, makes it so that these little guys can survive in this tank. And it's actually a very... Actually, the water parameters in my tank are even are, are pretty perfect, especially when you compare it to the water parameters of the lake, which actually their nitrites, nitrates, and ammonia are elevated due to the high concentration of invasive species that live in that particular area. But I feel as though I'm almost doing somewhat of a service removing all these rusties from the lake because if they continue to reproduce, they will continue to cause harm to the ecosystem. And, and uh, as a fisher... Or, well, I'm actually the wrangler, but my friends are anglers. I wrangle up the bait. That's how I'm able to catch, like, 40 of these in one night by hand. You know, that's what I do all night while they go fishing for the big stuff. You know, use them as bait. But what I'm getting at is uh, rusty crayfish are, are extremely invasive. They do a lot of damage to the ecosystem because they bully other native crayfish for uh, food, resources, etc., and at the end of the day, though, uh, what people end up doing is they pluck these crayfish out and they take them to a different fishing spot. And at the, if they don't catch enough, they just dump them. And that's the most irresponsible thing to do because now you're introducing an invasive species into a new area. And uh, it's it, it causes a lot of problems. So what I'd rather do is take them and eat them myself. And I think the bass and the catfish are onto something because these little guys are tasty. Makes me want to cook up a bunch more, but unfortunately, I'm still collecting. I'm still at the 40, yeah, about 40 crayfish mark, which sounds like a lot if you have them in a tank, but honestly, it's not. Actually, I, I can show the tank in a later video. It's got tons of PVC tubes all surrounded in it so that each crayfish has a spot to hide so they don't feel threatened by the other crayfish. Now, what I might do is garnish the plate even further with some banded killifish, black striped top minnow, or I might even go with another invasive species, the round goby, which is even more detrimental than the rusty crayfish. And uh, yeah, I bet you came here looking for a food video, and now I'm giving you a kind of a lecture on the invasive species. But the round goby is an extremely invasive species that does even far more damage. In fact, the uh, round when when there's round gobies in an area, even uh, predators their their population dwindles for a number of reasons. Look into it; it's very interesting. Some of them can grow big. I have a few of them in my tanks. Uh, that I had them for a research, and uh, they're quite fun to look at because they got big puffy cheeks. Like, but. Uh, Mm, I might cook them up and see how they taste. Because actually, uh, round gobies, I believe in my area, have a kill on sight law, which is pretty strict. Uh, kill on sight laws basically mean that if you catch one, you got to kill it right away. I have no problem with that, but when I caught them, I didn't know what they were because they weren't in my area previously. So I brought them home, did some research, turns out it's a round goby, turns out that's bad. I have three of them in my tank that need to be part of something. I mean, I could easily chop them up, fillet them up, and feed them to the crayfish, because the crayfish will eat them if I fillet them for it. But I feel like maybe there might be something more fun I could do with round gobies. So, yeah. Eaten invasives for the greater good of the ecosystem. So, <laughs> hey, if you stuck with me this long, congratulations. This has just been kind of a weird video, so I don't do rants often. Just thought it'd be kind of cool. So, stay fishy. If you're an aquarist, much love to you. I'm an aquarist as well. If you're an angler or a wrangler, much respect to you as well. You know, we're all, we're, we're two sides of the same coin. We work together, believe it or not, when you're as intertwined in the fish world as we are, 
we need to stop looking at each other and butting heads and come together because we cause each other problems and if we just sat down and talked about it, I think we could fix a lot of problems that have to do with fishing issues, ecosystem issues, and even issues that go all the way to aquariums. So, thanks for joining me, guys. Uh, hope you found this rant good at killing time, because it wasn't really all that amazing, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, have a good one.